Now let's talk about another problem, which is where do you see the potential for AI in solving problems that we can't even solve on the best day at the best hospitals with the best doctors? So let me give you an example. We can't really diagnose Alzheimer's disease until it appears to be at a point that for all intents and purposes is irreversible. Um, maybe on a good day, we can halt progression really, really early in a patient with just a whiff of MCI, mild cognitive impairment, um, maybe with an early amyloid detection and an anti-amyloid drug. But do you, I mean, is it science fiction to imagine that there will be a day when an AI could listen to a person's voice, watch the movements of their eyes, study the movements or of their gait, and predict 20 years in advance when a person is staring down the barrel of a neurodegenerative disease and act at a time when maybe we could actually reverse it? I mean, how science fiction-y is that? I don't believe it's science fiction at all. Do you know that looking at retinas today, images of retina, straightforward convolutional neural network, neural network, not even ones that involve transformers, can already tell you by just looking at your retina, not just whether you have retinal disease, but if you have hypertension, if you're male, if you're female, how old you are, and some estimate of your longevity. And that's just looking at the back of your eye mm -hmm. and have seen enough uh, data. When you, when I'm, I did a study, I was, I was a small player in a study that appeared in Nature in 2005 with uh, Bruce Yankner. We were looking at uh, frontal lobes of individuals uh, who had died for a variety of reasons, often in accidents, um, of various ages. And we saw, bad news for people like me, that after age 40, your transcriptome, the genes that are switched on, fell off a cliff. Like 30% of your transcriptome went down. And, um, and so there seemed to be a big difference in the expression of genes around age 40. And there was, but there was one 90 year old who looked like the, the young guy. So maybe there's hope for some of us. <laughs> but, but then I thought about it afterwards and there were other things that actually have much smoother functions, which I don't have quite the follow up, like our skin. So our skin ages and in fact, all our organs age and they age at different rates. You're, you're saying that the transcriptome of the skin, you did not see this cliff-like effect at a given age the way you saw it in the frontal cortex. Okay. That's right. And so different organs age at different, at different rates, uh, but having the, the right data sets um, and the ability to see nuances that we don't notice makes it very clear to me that um, the early detection part, no problem. So that is going to be very straightforward. The treatment part, we can, we can talk about it as well. But um, again, um, we had early on from the uh, very famous Framingham heart study, a predictor of when you had going to have heart uh, disease based on just a handful of variables. Now we have these artificial intelligence models that based on hundreds of, of variables can predict various other diseases. And it will do Alzheimer's, I believe, uh, very soon. I think you'll be able to see a combination of gait, speech patterns, um, picture of your body, picture of your skin, and eye movements, like you said, will be a very accurate predictor. Um, I just We just published, by the way, recently, something about eyes. A very nice uh, study uh, where in a car, just by looking at the, at the driver, it can figure out what your blood sugar is because diabetics previously have not been able to get driver licenses sometimes because of the worry about them passing out because of hypoglycemia. So there was a very nice study that showed that you could just 
by looking have ca- cameras pointed at the eyes hmm. and actually figure out exactly what the blood sugar is. So th- that's that kind of detection is, I think, fairly straightforward. It's a different question about what you can do about it. Before we go to the what you can do about it, I just want to go a little deeper on the on the predictive side. Um, yes. You brought up the Framingham model or the yeah. multi-ethnic study on atherosclerosis, the MESA model. These are the two most popular models by far for for looking at major adverse cardiac event, a major adverse cardiac event risk prediction. Um, but you needed something else to build those models, which was enough time to see the outcome, right? So you had to, in the Framingham cohort, which was the late 70s and early 80s, you then had the Framingham offspring cohort, and then you had to be able to follow these people with their LDLC and HDLC and triglycerides, and later, eventually, they incorporated calcium scores. So if today we said, look, we want to be able to predict 30-year mortality which is something no model can do today. This is a big pet peeve of mine is we generally talk about cardiovascular disease through the lens of 10 year risk, which I think is ridiculous. We should talk about lifetime risk, but I would settle for 30 year risk, frankly. And if we had a 30 year risk model where we could take many more inputs and I would absolutely love to be looking at the retina. I, I believe, by the way, Zach, that retinal examination should be a part of medicine today for everybody. I, I would take a retinal exam over a hemoglobin A1C all day, every day. I'd never look at another A1C again if I could see the retina of every one of my patients. Um, but my point is, even if effective today, we, we could define the data set and let's overdo it and we can prune things later, but we want to see these 50 things in everybody to predict every disease. How, is there any way to get around the fact that we're going to need 30 years to see this come to fruition in terms of watching how the story plays out? Or are we basically going to say, no, you're, you know, we're going to do this over five years, but it will only, you know, it won't be that useful because a five-year predictor basically means you're already catching people in the throes of the disease. I'll say... Three words, electronic health records. So that turns out not to be the answer in the United States. Why? Because in the United States, we move around. We don't stay in any given healthcare system that long. So very rarely will I have all the measurements made on you, Peter, uh, all your all your glycohemoglobins, all your blood pressures, all your clinic visits, all the imaging studies that you've had. However, that's not the case in Israel, for example. In Israel, they have these HMOs, health maintenance organizations, and one of them, Kralit, I have a, a good relationship with because they published all the big COVID studies looking at the efficacy of uh, the vaccine. And why could they do that? Because they had the whole population uh, available. And they have about 20, 25 years worth of data on all their patients and in detail and family family relationships. So if you have that kind of data and Kaiser Permanente also has that kind of data, I think you can actually come close now. But you're not going to be able to get retina, gait, voice. So, so no. it's, yeah, because we still have to it, get it, those prospectively. Those you still have to get, but I'm going to claim that there are proxies, rough proxies, but for gait, Falls, um, yeah. and for um, um, you know hearing problems, uh, visits to the audiologist. Now these are noisier measurements. Yeah, and so the so those of us who are uh, data, data junkies like I am always keep uh, mumbling to ourselves: "Perfect is the enemy of good." And so. <laughs> um, Waiting 30 years to have the perfect data set is not the right answer to help patients now. And there are things that we could know now that we that are knowable today that we just don't know because we haven't bothered to look. I'll give you a quick example. I I did a study of um, autism using electronic health records maybe 15 years ago. And I saw there was a lot of GI problems. And I talked to a, a, a pediatric expert and they said, it was a little bit dismissive. They said, brain bad, tummy hurt. I said, but I've seen a lot of inflammatory bowel disease, like things that, you know, I, I just doesn't make sense to me that this is somehow effective 
brain function. To make a long story short, we did a massive study. We're looking forward to tens of thousands of individuals. And sure enough, we found subgroups of patients who had immunological problems associated with their autism, and they had type 1 diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, lots of infections. Those were knowable, but they were not known. And I had, frankly, parents come to me more thankful that for anything else I had never done for them clinically, because I was telling that these parents, telling these parents they weren't hallucinating, that these kids had these problems. They just weren't being recognized by medicine because no one had the, the big wide angle to see these trends. So uh, without knowing the field of Alzheimer's the way I do other fields, I bet you there are trends in Alzheimer's that are you can pick up today by looking at enough patients yeah. that you'll find some that have more frontotemporal components, yep. some that have more effective components, some that have more of an infectious uh, and immunological component. Those are knowable today. 